last class, we, we sort of cut it off early before we could actually finish. Um, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the stuff we missed uh, in, in the context of database storage. And then we'll switch over now talking about buffer pools and memory. So the, if you remember from the last class, I showed all these examples about uh, of, of storing tuples and pages. And the way that we were going to store the tuples on those pages is in contiguous order. And it's usually in the order that you specify when you create the table. Right? So I have attributes A, B, and C. For you know, one tuple on one page, I'll store A followed by B followed by C. And at that point, the tuple ends, and then the next tuple starts. Right? These are sort of sto stored in uh, contiguous order. So again, it's important to note that the relational model doesn't say anything about how data should be actually physically stored. Right? You're only defining what the logical schema looks like and what the application has to, has to deal with. And there's no point, is, does, it, does it require that you have to store it the way that you define it in the table. And as we'll see in a second, it actually may be the case, the way to store tuples in the way I was showing, where you just sort of one after another in, in, in sequential order, may actually not be the best thing to do for all workloads. Right? So to motivate this example, I'm going to use a, a three-table database, a real simple one, uh, that's actually derived from Wikipedia. So if you go download the MediaWiki software, there's, there'll be a MySQL DDL file, and it'll have roughly these, these, these create table uh, statements in it. So we'll have a user, a user account table with a user ID and name. There's a bunch of extra stuff that you have for a user account that we don't care about. Uh, then we'll have a pages table where we keep track of the, you know, here, all the different articles in Wikipedia. We'll have a page ID and a title. And then there'll be a revisions table where you actually contain the the foreign key reference to the, the pages table and the user, user table. So for each revision, you keep track of what user made that change and uh, what page did that revision belong to. Right? So it's, it's, again, it's a real simple table where they have uh, uh, this, this hierarchy like this. So we didn't really talk about this too much in the beginning, but I mentioned it in the first class uh, about, about what sort of had the categories of database workloads that are out there. So if you remember, the first one I talked about was online transaction processing, or OLTP. And the way to characterize now the, these particular workloads is through three key properties. We'll talk later what a transaction actually means, but for now, just think of like applying some change to the database or, or in, in response to some user action. So for example, if you go to Amazon and you add something to a cart, it's going to store that in the database. That, that action of adding things to the cart in the database is a transaction. Or in the case of Wikipedia, updating a, uh, a, a page and adding a new revision, that's considered a transaction. So in OLTP workloads, the transactions are going to be really short-lived, meaning it's going to go into the database, make some, some, some change, and then immediately save everything. Right? Again, think of again you know, on Amazon, you click something out of the cart, it comes back right away. Uh, the amount of data you're actually going to read and write in a transaction is actually going to be pretty small as well. Again, think of like on Amazon, you don't, you're not allowed to go manipulate other people's accounts on Amazon, right? You can only add things to your card. You can only make purchases on, for your items. Right? So the, 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 the total Amazon database is really big, but the amount of data that you're touching per transaction is actually really small. And the last one is that these transactions are going to be very repetitive. Again, think on Amazon. You add somebody to the card. That's, you, know, you can't really do arbitrary things on the Amazon store, store interface, right? You can add things to the card. You can buy things. You can update your payment information. Right? And so everybody else is updating those, invoking those same transactions. So it's the same code over and over again being invoked for these transactions. So you're just doing the same operations over and over again. So the way to think about OLTP is that this is also usually the kind of application you'll build when you first start you know, building a new system or building a new application. Like if you're a new startup, right, the first thing you end up building is usually a, an OLTP application because you don't have any data to analyze because you haven't collected anything yet. So this is the, this is the part where you actually collect that data. And then once you have that data, you actually want to start asking questions about it. Then you enter the realm of online analytical processing, or OLAP workloads. Right, so these are usually read-only queries, where you're going to read large segments of, of tables of the database and try to extrapolate new knowledge. Right, you want to find things that, uh, you know, what's the most bought item after a hurricane, things like that. And you're asking questions about your data. So these queries touch, usually touch a lot of data. So therefore, it's going to be much longer running than the OLTP queries, the OLTP transactions. And you're often going to do joins between multiple tables 
to combine them together, right? You follow the foreign key references or whatever. You put, you put the, the tables together and, and find the data you're looking for. And also sometimes you see what are called exploratory queries where this is maybe you don't know what you're actually looking for just yet. So you're going to execute a bunch of random queries uh, that, that are just sort of exploring the data. Like think of like a, a tool like MicroStrategy or Tableau or any kind of visualization tool. You know, you're, an, you're in the interface, user interface, you're clicking some buttons, looking at different charts. Those are all considered exploratory queries. So OLAP is actually much different than, for all these reasons, than the OLTP side, but as well as the fact that nothing's really repetitive. Maybe you have like a dashboard that you occasionally refresh, but that example where you're updating a visualization tool, those are random queries. So the system can't really do too much to like, you know, pre-compute some of the things you may be looking for. So uh, I have some sample queries actually here. So in the case of the OLTP side, you, these, these are some sample queries like, uh, getting the last revision for a particular page, updating your user account to say that when you logged in, and then inserting a new re revision record. And then for the OLAP query, you see it's actually doing something more complicated where it's going to scan all of the user accounts and find any user account that, that logged in with a .gov uh, host name. Right? This is sort of famous a few years ago where there was politicians on you know, government computers going updating their Wikipedia pages to say, you know, to say flattering things about themselves or remove any scandals that they have. Right? So there was a published report about this a while ago where people found people on Wikipedia with .gov uh, host names modifying Wikipedia. Right? So this again basically you group by on the, the count the number of logins per month for, uh, for government accounts. So Given that these workload, we have these different workloads, now we can talk about how do we actually want to store our tuples. And so the precise term of what we've been assuming so far in, in this semester is called the n -ary storage model. If you recall from maybe the first or second lecture, I said n -ary, uh, uh tuples are when you have an arbitrary a number of attributes. So in this case here, for the n -ary storage model, you're going to store all those attributes together uh, for each tuple. And the next tuple doesn't begin until you get all the attributes for, for, for the first tuple. Right? And it's, it's exactly as, as, as we've been showing throughout the semester, right? So basically, the, the database system is going to store all the attributes for a single tuple, one after another. So in this case here, each row corresponds to a single tuple. And you have all the, all the values for all the attributes in line with each other. And then if, when it's finished, then you go on to the next tuple. Right? So then, basically, in a NSM uh, database system, you'll store uh, you know, this page, you know, store the tuples like this in a single page. Right? So this is basically saying, with the exception to the overflow stuff we talked about last class, all the data for a single tuple will be packed together in, in, in a single page. So for simple queries, like selecting the user account uh, for get a single record where they have the username and password, this is, this is actually a good, pretty good thing to, for us, right? Because we'll do a lookup in some kind of index, whether it's a hash table or a B plus tree, we don't care. And then it's going to identify uh, the, the, the record ID, which is the page ID and offset or a slot, for the particular page that we need. And then we go to that offset and go grab the, all the values that, that we need. And so the reason why this is really good for OLTP workloads is because most of these times in OLTP workloads, you, you, the queries need all the data for, a, for an attribute. Right? We're not just trying to go, you know, get one single column. So that means, in this case here, it's a select star. So that means when we brought this page in, we used all the data that, that, that was contained in this page. We didn't have to go to another page to get something else. Right? And we, yes, we read, end up reading tuples that we weren't going to use in our query, but that's sort of unavoidable, as we said, because we can't uh, address tuples in single, you know, single cache lines or, or, or single bytes, right? Everything has to be organized in these pages, so we always have to get the page and get other tuples uh, when we go in to get one, just one. All right, and if we do an insert, same thing. It's really easy, right? We just go grab a page and we can just do a straight copy of all our data directly into one slot, right? And it's essentially one, one mem copy operation. So let's look at an example now where this is actually a bad idea. So let's use that OLAP query that I showed before. Right? And if we now look at in the query, we can actually identify what attributes or what columns we actually need. Right? So in this case here, in our where clause, it's doing uh, the comparison for the, uh, on the, running a like on the host name. And assume we don't have an index on that. 
So that means we basically have to scan every single page in our database. We have to do a sequential scan to look at everything, to find tuples that'll match our predicate. But then it's actually worse. Say we bring in one tuple now. When we now actually look at what columns we're accessing in our query, right, we know we need to do a comparison on the host name, so we're gonna have to look at all, all these attributes here. So that basically means that we're gonna have to scan these tuples, right, and jump to different offsets one by one to go get that single host name attribute. And then up above here, we actually want to do our, our, the output we want to produce is based on the, the login. And so we'll do the same thing. We're, for every time we have a matching tuple, then we have to you know, jump to the next, next offset, go grab the attribute for the, the last login, and then put it in whatever hash table we're using to compute this aggregation. So what's the big problem with this? Page what's that? Page falls, sure, but like, b besides that. Correct, yeah, so there's, there's five attributes in this table, and all these other ones here we brought into memory, and we're not even using them, right? So this is essentially when we, this is relevant to when we start talking about the buffer pool stuff, is we're bringing in data that we're never actually gonna need, and it's ending up taking space in memory in our buffer pool, and so we're gonna end up evicting uh, other pages to make space for this, this data, um, and then we're just gonna get terrible, terrible performance. Question or no? Okay. Um, so the advantages of the NRA model is that there's really good for fast inserts, updates, and deletes when you're accessing entire tuples. Um, but they're really bad when you want to do analytical queries, when you want to scan maybe a portion of the, of the actual attributes in the table, and you want to scan you know, the, the entire table or a large subset of it. So what's one solution to this? Column store, correct, yes. So the, the sort of precise term of it is called the decomposition storage model. And basically what's gonna happen is instead of storing sort of everything in rows, we're gonna store all the data in columns in our page. That means that all the values for a single attribute will appear aligned with each other together. And then when that, you run out of, out of those tuples, or out of, the, out of the values for all the tuples, then you start the, the next one. Right, so it'd be sort of like this. So for a single page, we're gonna have only the host name attribute, right, for this table. And internally, there's some metadata we're keeping track of to say like, well, we know that uh, there's a host name page and then there's, there's other pages for, for the other attributes, and we know how to jump to particular offsets in those, those columns, uh, the columnar pages, to go find the tuple that we want if we wanna stitch it back together. So now if we go execute that query that we had before, now we see that to do the scan on the host name, since we don't have an index, well, it's just a single page to go get the thing we, things we need, right? And we would identify at which offsets in our column we have the matching value that we want. Then we go fetch the, the host name page, uh, sorry, go fetch the, fetch the lo last login page, and it's the same thing. Now we just go grab a single attribute uh, or single page, and it's gonna, we can jump to the offsets and get the value that we need to compute the answer. So before my simple example, right, when I ran this query under the, uh, the NSM model, the row store, I had to scan all six pages. But now with the column store for this particular example, I only need to scan two. Yes? If you had a large number of attributes, wouldn't there be a lot of storage overhead for storing the primary keys for each of these values across so many different values? All right, so his question is, Actually, I don't, I don't have slides for this, but we, we, I could maybe cover this later. Um, his question is, do, is this, is this going to be wasteful because now I need to store the primary key for every single attribute, tuple attribute in my column store? The answer is no, because what they actually do is all based on implicit offsets. So host name is a bad example because it's a var char, but let's say you always have 32-bit integers. If I'm the 12th tuple in one column, I know how to jump to the 12th tuple to the next column. So you don't actually need to store the extra primary keys. You just have to store the, you just, you just have to compute the offset using simple arithmetic. So the offset for a given tuple is going to be the same across each of the columns? Correct, yes. Now for the var chars, that's when things get tricky. And typically what they do is do dictionary encoding. So you'll have, you'll convert the var char into a, um, to a, to a unique integer, and there's like a hash table, a mapping table that maps that integer to the original value. So then in your column store, you only store the, the, the fixed offset value. Um, 
There's other things, uh, uh, tricky things you have to deal with when you do compression, like arbitrary compression, like, like gzip or snappy, because those things are always, aren't always going to be uh, fixed, you know, fixed width, fixed, fixed length. So you have to do some padding to make sure the offset always works out. Right? So yeah, so, so in most column stores that I know of, you don't actually store any extra data. You just compute the offset. That's a good point. All right, so uh, the advantages of using a uh, column store or DSM model is that it's going to reduce the amount of I.O. we have to do uh, when we want to do uh, OLAP queries because we're only actually going to just read exactly the data we need. We never end up reading more than we actually need. Um, and then, again, we'll, we'll cover this later, but it's gonna do, we're going to do better query processing and get better compression because of uh, all the data now that, that for a single attribute are going to be packed together, and they're not going to be sort of spread out. So a really, really simple way to think about this is that, say we have a column that says the sex of a person, right? And it's either, say, this is binary, male or female. And so now you're going to have a bunch of Ms followed by a bunch of Fs followed by a bunch of Ms. And so you can do run length encoding to, to pack those guys in and do that real efficiently. And by better query processing, I'll say that some systems later on we'll talk about is they actually can delay the actual decompression of the data as far up the query plan as possible. So now you're actually at operating queries on compressed data rather than decompressed data. And that, that allows you to get much better performance too because now you're not blowing out your, your, your buffer pool. Right? And the obvious downside of this is that the, traditionally the DSMs are going to be much slower for any OLTP operations because now you need to take your tuple and split it up into all the different attributes and do separate writes to separate pages. Right? And that's going to be much more expensive. And then if you want to ever do a select star and put a query back to, tuple back together, you got to stitch, you know, do all the fetches and stitch it, stitch it right back. So uh, column stores are kind of like um, standard technology now. Although I don't think the textbook covers it, which is surprising. Uh, there's, but and it's not. It's certainly not a new idea, right? So back in the 1970s, the first sort of known uh, description of a column store database system was this thing called Cantor. There's only one page because it wasn't a commercial system. It was built by like the Swedish defense contractors or something like that. But they basically talk about how how, how you can build a column store database. And then in the 1980s, there was a more formal academic proposal of the DSM uh, storage model. And then in the 1990s, Sybase came out with a system called Sybase IQ, which is actually still available today. And that was sort of like an in-memory accelerator. Uh, 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 sort of, think of it as like a sort of caching server in front of your database system. But it was really in the 2000s that column stores like, finally really took off and became more commonplace because the internet came along and everybody started collecting a lot, a lot of data really quickly. And so you needed something that could, could be able to handle this. Um, you know, traditionally before the internet, only you know, a very small number of corporations actually had really big databases. Places like Walmart, for example. Uh, but once the internet came along, you can put an app up and start collecting a lot of data really quickly and you needed something to be able to crunch it. And so in the 2000s, you had Vertica, was probably the most famous column store that was built by my, my advisor, Mike Snowbreaker. Vectorwise was a system out of, um, out of Europe that got bought by Actian. Um, and then MonetDB was an academic system that's actually still avail available today. But now in the 2010s, right, every, everybody have basically has a column store. Like Cloudera Impala, Amazon has Redshift, and then Oracle, SQL Server uh, from Microsoft, and IBM will all sell you sort of column store extensions. And they basically do, do exactly as I, as I described here. So any questions about column stores? So the SQLite system you guys are working on and the, the storage manager you're building for your first project will be an NSM system. It'll be a row store. Uh, and this is because SQLite is inherently a, a row store. So it's more than just saying you're going to store things in columns versus rows. There's actually a bunch of extra stuff you have to do when you actually process queries, like the light materialization that I mentioned before, to actually get the benefits of, uh, of, of, a, of a DSM system. OK? All right, so, um, so now let's switch to today's lecture. All right, so we covered, all right, so today now we're going to talk about to, uh, the memory side of things, right? Um, so the previous lecture, again, was, it was all about how the data system is going to store data on disk and files. And now the question we're going to deal with is how is the data management system going to bring data into memory uh, and be able to crunch on it and possibly write it out later? 
right? And we have to do this because your database system can't operate directly on files on disk, right? It has to copy things in memory first, make changes, and then write them out as, as 4K blocks or, or possibly uh, larger. So again, so our goal, what we want to try to achieve now with our buffer pool is that we wanted the, the database system to have the illusion to the user or the application that the system has more memory than, than is actually available. So the, another way to think about the problem we're, we're trying to deal with is in terms of spatial control or temporal control. So spatial control is what we sort of covered a bit last class. It has to do with how the data system is going to, going to store or organize pages physically on, on the storage device. Right? We said that in sort of if you're using a spinning disk hard drive, you care about having uh, a lot of sequential reads and writes. So you try to organize your data spatially to be in contiguous order. Right? And even if you go down to at least within a single page, you, know, you want to put tuples maybe in a page that are actually going to be accessed together. Uh, so that, again, it's one disk read or one fetch to go get the thing that you need. And so now what we're talking about is essentially how the data system is going to have temporal control of, of, of its data. And so that has to do with when is it going to read pages into memory and when is it going to write them out the disk. So we're not going to talk too much about writing things out. Uh, at this point, this will come up later when we talk about concurrent control and recovery. So at, at this point, we're really talking about how do we, how do we copy data in, and then we when we have to make room for new data, how do we make decisions about what to move out? The the one thing I'll say too is that the this is all sort of very interconnected with things that were discussed later in the class, uh, and so I, I don't want to talk too much about writing data out because. For that, you have to understand how the concurrent control stuff works, and you have to understand the, the logging protocol. Um, but it's a suffice to say that it's sort of related to the question that somebody had last class of why can't, can you just use RocksDB to manage your, your log for you? Uh, and the answer is no, because the, the, all these different parts of the system need to know what they're doing, because you don't want to have uh, data written out to a, a page before you write out the log. Right? This, this, it's, you have to be very careful how you order these things to make sure that when you crash to come back, you can re recover the database to a correct state from non-volatile storage. And so last class, I also railed on about how the OS, using the OS to manage your memory, is, is going to be a bad idea. Right? And the two things that we pointed out was that the database system needs to always have complete control over what, what's going on, uh, meaning what data is brought in and when things get evicted. And the other issue that we have is that the, the OS will stall any thread when it touches a page that's not memory. You get a page fault, the OS blocks you, and while it goes and fetches the thing that, that you need. Sort of related to that also, too, it's more than just actually stalling you know, your thread that's, that's bad. Anytime you actually go in the kernel, that's always bad, too, because that's actually really slow. Because now there's going to be the kernel has mutexes and locks inside of it, so going down in the kernel is always an expensive operation. So we try to avoid syscalls as much as possible. We try to do everything in, in user level. So. There are some ways to get around uh, some of these limitations with MMAP, and I don't, I don't want you know, I don't want to spend an entire lecture on MMAP, MMAP which I think is a bad idea. Uh, but there, you know, just in case you think like, oh, MMAP doesn't, you know, is completely opaque to the database system, there are some uh, API calls you can make to the operating system to sort of get it maybe to do exactly what you want to do. So first of all, with there's a, a there's a function you can call called mAdvise, where you tell the operating system uh, hints about how you, the, the database system or the, your process expects to read certain pages in memory. Right? And it can tell you, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to do sequential reads on these ranges of pages. I'm going to read this page once and then, and then never read it again. Um, you can also use mLock to tell the operating system that certain pages can't be uh, evicted. And this is essentially doing the same thing as the pin operation that we'll talk about later in the class, where you, you, you know, you're telling that this, this page is being operated on by a thread right now. No one's allowed to actually go and evict it until I'm done. And then the last one would be msync, is where you tell the operating system that it's now, I want to block my process until these, these pages actually have been flushed out to disk, right? Because you want to do this for durability reasons. So again, this sort of seems like this is going to solve all our problems. Uh, and there's certainly been a lot of attempts to actually use mmap for in, in, in database systems. All right, I don't want to make it sound like that nobody actually does this. Um, 
So the MonadB is the system I mentioned before that is the column store. They're entirely based on, uh, on, on MMAP. And then LMDB is a embedded database system, sort of like SQLite, that uses MMAP to manage, manage their buffers. Um, MonadB is a OLAP system, meaning you, you don't want to run transactions on it. So this is actually kind of reasonable. Uh, for LMDB, uh, for reasons I can't say on video, uh, because the guy knows who, who's we are, who, who we are and doesn't like us, uh, I'll talk about, talk about that later. Um, so, so with LMDB, they're trying to be an embedded system, and they only have a single writer, so they, using these tricks might be good enough. Um, more famously probably would be the system MongoDB. Uh, when they were first built and first came out, they used MMAP, MMAP entirely. And a lot of the ways they got around the concurrency issues is that they had a single database lock, meaning only one thread could ever read and write to the database at a time. Um, again, you have to do this because the ordering of your operations, needs, you have to do that very carefully. And although these, these hints that you can tell the operating system seem like they're the right thing, the operating system doesn't always follow them precisely. And they're certainly not portable. Like these don't, some of these don't actually work on Windows. Um, MemSQL, last I heard, uses it for their column store, which is again sort of the, the, the read-only side of the system. SQLite has an option to use MMAP if you want to. It's turned off by default. Uh, if you're actually very curious, you can go read the manual. They say, here's all the problems with MMAP, and here's why it's here if you actually need it, but we don't recommend using it. Um, and part of that has to do because they need to run on all sorts of crazy operating systems and hardware, and all of these sort of embedded devices may not actually have the same support that Linux does. And then the InfluxDB guys we had last week, where they use MMAP to be just the buffer pool for read-only pages. Right, so they, they write out pages not using MMAP, and then later on they, they read them in using MMAP. And that's essentially ending up the same thing with, with MonaDB. You have a read-only database. So again, the, so the main issue is that these APIs are not going to be portable. Uh, it still doesn't help us in the OS blocking our th thread whenever we have a, have a, have a page fault. Um, and as we see later on, and I guess we, we, we can run experiments if you're actually curious, uh, it's really tricky to make sure the OS actually orders your writes. Right? Just because you say, you know, I write these pages, and you do an msync, it doesn't mean they're, they're going to be written in exactly that order. The operating system can do anything that it wants. And again, from a database system perspective, that's, that's bad. Because we want to make sure that we don't have anything written out the disk until we have a log entry written first. OK? All right, so the main takeaway from all of this is, again, the database system is always going to know better uh, than the operating system. And therefore, we want to manage memory ourselves. And so the buffer pool is, the, is essentially the in-memory cache that sits above the disk manager and uh, below any other parts of the system. That's essentially going to be the memory manager for, for us. Question or no? OK. OK, so uh, and again, as I, as I mentioned before, we have to make sure that our buffer pool is going to work nicely with our concurrency goal scheme and our logging recovery scheme. But for, for now, we, we, don't, we don't have to worry about that. So another important thing that I should have mentioned earlier, uh, but I want to talk about now, is this distinction between locks and latches. So you might have seen on the first project, I said, like, make sure you protect your, your, your data structures with a latch. And so uh, this is sort of an ongoing debate between the operating system people and the database system people. In the database system world, we refer to things that protect data structures as latches. In the operating system world, they refer to these as locks. And the reason why you have to make this distinction is because in the database world, a lock is used to, to protect the logical contents of the database, protecting like an index, a page, or, or, a, um, or not a page, sorry, or, or like a tuple, or a range of tuples, things like that, or a table. And so a lock will be held for the duration of an entire transaction. Right? Think of like I start a transaction, and I want to make a bunch of updates, so I lock my tuples for that, for that transaction. And then we also need to make sure that if we make any changes, but then, then the transaction aborts, we have to be able to roll back those changes before we release those locks. So locks are a higher level construct that, 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 that are exposed to the application. Underneath the covers, though, when we're actually building our database system, we will use what are called latches. And these are actually going to protect the, the critical sections in the internal data structures that the database system uses to manage data, execute queries, and, and do other things. And so the thing of latches are sort of, again, like if you're coming from an OS world, this would be like a mutex. These are short-lived, meaning you're going to go into an index, make some change, and then release your latch. 
go and update your page table or your extendable hash table, and then release the latch. And we don't actually need to care about rolling back any changes because, again, this is all being done internally. It's not exposed to the application. So that, for example, that means if you try to acquire a latch on an index and you can't, then you have to have the code actually retry, the database system code. Whereas if you, if you try to acquire a lock in the application and you can't, then it's up to the application to retry this. So the data system won't try to do that for you, always. All right, so just to be clear, when I say latch, I mean like a mutex, a spin lock, which is also confusing, but a low level uh, protection primitive in, in, in our internal data structures. We'll cover logical locks later on when we talk about concurrency control. All right, so today, uh, the things we want to focus on are uh, sort of high level what the buffer pool manager does, and then we'll spend some time talking about replacement policies, allocation policies, and then I'll just sort of finish up talking about uh, what other types of memory pools the data system can, can, can maintain, right? Because for our purpose here, we're focus, focusing on what I'll consider index data or, or tuple data. But there's a bunch of other stuff we need memory for as well. All right, so the, the buffer pool at a high level is essentially just some large region of memory, I shouldn't say large because it's an embedded system, it won't be that large, but it's some region of memory uh, that's going to be split up into like a fixed size array, right? The, the size of every element of that array is going to be the size of our pages, right? Now you see again why we have to have fixed size pages that are, that are, that are always the same because then it's easy to jump to offsets in, in that array. So every entry in that array where we actually can store a page will be called a frame. Right? And this is also sort of a more database parlance, right? Because we talked about slots before was an entry where you store a tuple on a page. And now in memory, we, we refer to a frame as the entry where you store a page that's been copied in. So what happens is that when a, the data system comes along and it wants to re request a page, it has to uh, first copy that page, uh, or it'll copy that page into one of these free frames, right? So in this case here, if I, if, uh, you know, for page one, it's copied here. Um, and then page three would be copied there. And so the key thing to point out too also here is that when we make this copy from disk into a frame in our buffer pool, it'll, it's going to be an exact copy, meaning we don't have to do any deserialization or marshalling of, of, of any, the contents of, the, of the, the data. It's an exact copy of the bytes from, from the disk into our buffer pool. And this, this might be different than things like, you know, say like JSON or, or protobuf where you actually do some deserialization and some, some marshalling, unmarshalling when you go from disk or off the, the network into, into memory. In our world, it's an exact byte for byte copy into, into memory. Right, so the, the buffer pool will also maintain what's called a page table. Uh, and the page table is essentially just a table that's keeping track of what pages are in memory. So if your upper level parts of the system says, I need to access tuple in you know, page, page one, then you would go to the page table and say, well, find me the frame in my buffer pool where I have, it, have this page. And then now you have a pointer to memory th that, that, that you're given, and then the other parts of the system, the threads, can actually then process on, on that data directly. Right? Once the thing's in the buffer pool, you don't actually make another copy of it. You just pass around pointers to other parts, other, other parts of it. So in our page table, we need to keep track of uh, some additional metadata. So the first will be a dirty flag that will get set whenever a thread modifies a, a page. And we need to know this because if we ever need to evict this page in order to make, up, make space for a new page copied from disk, the data system needs to know that, oh, this thing's been modified since I last copied it in, so therefore I, I need to write it out. If it's, the dirty bit is not set, then you can just immediately throw it away because you don't care about, about writing it back because you know you have the exact copy still on disk. And then there will also be a, a pin flag or pin counter. Uh, and this is essentially saying to, uh, in the system, you're telling the, you're telling the buffer pool manager that some thread is doing something on this page right now, so you're not allowed to evict it. Either you're reading it or writing it, right? It doesn't matter what it is, you always need to actually pin this. So sometimes you can set this as, as a flag, other times there's a counter because that helps you understand how, uh, how highly contended, how active a, a a, a page is actually being used. Um, but I would say the pin count is not the same thing as the latch on the page. Uh, because if you have a thread that actually wants to make a modification, you want to take a, a latch on the page as well, because then you prevent other threads from actually writing it. Right? So you can have multiple threads accessing the page and reading it. If they're not making changes, that's not an issue. They, they, don't, they don't conflict with each other. But if you have a page 
If you have a thread modifying a page, then you need to put, take a latch on that page. You also need to take a latch on the page table anytime you want to uh, add a new entry. So say if I, I do a look at my page table to see whether you know, some, some page is, is there, say page two, uh, I have to take a latch on the entry in that page, then go check in the page table, or sorry, the buffer pool, to see whether it's there. And then if it's not, then I do my copy into my buffer pool, and which you have to take a latch on, on that data structure as well. And then I can do my update into the page table and add the pointer now to where, where that page exists in the buffer pool. And then once that's done, I, I can release the latch. So we won't talk about this too much in this class, but this will come up when we, if, you, if you take the advanced class in, in memory databases. Uh, every single time you access a page, you have to take the latch on the page table to go check the pointer to see whether it's in, it's in memory. So if you have a lot of memory uh, and your database fits entirely in memory, then every page is always being in memory. And therefore, you're taking essentially a useless latch to go check to see whether it's in memory every single time. But an in-memory database makes the assumption that it's always going to be in memory. So therefore, it doesn't have a page table like this. And you don't have to take a latch to go find see whether, where's the offset that you're, you're looking for. You know how to jump exactly to that memory location. So in a OTP system, uh, if, you know, if you have something, an important application and you have money, uh, usually if you have customers, you have money, uh, then you can afford enough RAM to put your entire database in memory or most of it in memory. And therefore, again, doing this check every single time in the page table would, would be is, is expensive and essentially superfluous. Um, in OLAP systems, you know, those are much, much larger databases, so you have to do that because you, you know, you're scanning large, 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 large segments of the tables, and you're always updating the page table, so that latch is necessary. Okay. Uh, so in the example that I showed here, we had a, sim you know, a single buffer pool for an entire database system. But there's, again, there's nothing about how we design our system that says we have to do that. So uh, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. Uh, so you can have multiple buffer pool instances for, for your entire database system. So MySQL does this. They essentially do, think of like, I have a page ID, I run a hash function on it, and then I have a fixed number of, of buffer pool instances, and that hash tells me where to go find that page. And they do this because then you don't have to take that latch on a single page table for every single, you know, that, that you may be contending on across all your, your, all your pages for all your threads. Now you can, you can reduce contention because you can partition essentially the accesses to the different uh, buffer pools. Yes? Does the latch apply to the entire page table or just the page table This question is, does the latch apply to this, the entire page table or just the entry? Typically just the entry. Right? Because otherwise you're just locking the entire thing. Right? And I think, again, for the first project, I, we said that you actually can do either one. The, the lazy thing is just take a mutex on the entire data structure, right? But if you want to be you know, a bit smart about it, you take, you know, take the entry of it, all right? All right, so uh, to avoid the contention on the, on the page table, then in MySQL, they can actually split it, they split up to multiple instances. And this is something you define in your MySQL configuration file to say, like, the number of buffer pool instances you want. Um, but in the uh, sort of the commercial and enterprise database systems, you can do way, way, way more things. There's way more knobs, way more things you can configure. So you can do things like have a single buffer pool per database. You can have a single buffer pool per, per table. Uh, and then you can also split up your buffer pool based on different page types. So you can have a buffer pool for the indexes, buffer pool for table, buffer pool for <laughs> sorting buffers and things like that. Um, you can use all sorts of crazy things. Uh, so IBM, Oracle, so DB2, Oracle, Sybase, SQL Server, and Informix, I would call these enterprise systems, right? They're typically seen in, in older companies or, or lar large corporations. Um, there's all sorts of knobs you, you can do to tune all these things, right? Um, and again, the idea is that we just want to reduce the, the last contention, but also want to improve our locality because if we have, say, a table that we know is very important and we're going to be accessing it all the time. Maybe we don't, we don't want to pollute its buffer pool with pages from other, other tables where we don't care about so much that we have to go to disk to go get things for them. Right? So again, it just provides the DBA with more control to tune the system to get, to get better performance. Now, other things we can do in our buffer pool manager is actually, uh, which I think is kind of cool, is, is prefetching. So, you know, there's, there's 
there's operating system can try to prefetch pages if, it, if they know you're, you're scanning along an extent where you have a bunch of continuous pages. It can try to do things to say, well, I know you're going to read a couple, couple of pages ahead. Let me go ahead and fetch them into memory uh, for you. And so we can do that too in our database system. Uh, but we also can do something that they can't do where you have indirection in your data structures where you don't know exactly, uh, you don't, the pages you're going to be accessing aren't going to be exactly aligned. So for a sequential scan, it's really simple, right? You have, say, some query, and it wants to scan every single page. So it gets to the first one. It's not in the memory. So, so then it fetches in the, in the buffer pool, goes to the second one, um, and it's not there. And now the, the data systems can recognize that I'm going to keep on scanning the rest of the tables, uh, rest of pages in my table. So it'll go ahead and prefetch the, the, the next couple ones and start using them in memory. So now, or bringing them into memory. So now when I go along and I, I do my scan, the pages that I need are, are already there and I don't have to hit a page fall. Right? And the data system can do this because it knows exactly, well, roughly, what your query is, is trying to do. Right, because it has the query plan, it knows, uh, you know, it, it knows that you're, you, you know, you, you're going to do a sequential scan without a where clause. It knows you're going to hit every every single page. So we'll go ahead and prefetch the, these things for you. Right, and we can do this because we, we can do our I/O in a non-blocking manner with, with our buffer pool manager. So again, but the operating system can sort of do this already, right? Uh, but one cool thing the operating system can't do is when you want to do index scans. So let's say now that I have my index. And essentially, every node in the index is a separate page. Um, and I first want to start at the root in my index and try to find some entry and scan along the bottom. So I start at the top. I hit this page. It's not in memory, so I, ha I go fetch in my buffer pool. That's fine. And then I scan down to the second page because I'm traversing the tree. That's not in the buffer pool, so I go fetch that. But now what's going to happen is I'm going to hit this bottom page here and then scan along the leaf nodes to find data that I'm looking for. This is a very common thing to do with range scans. But the pages that I'm going to access are page 3 and page 5, which are not stored contiguously on disk. Right? So maybe if you could maybe prefetch 3, uh, but you're not going to be able to prefetch 5 because it's, it's physically farther away than, than where page 3 is at. So the operating system has no, can, cannot, simply can't do this at all because it won't know that you're, you know, you're scanning along some data structure that logically, or sort of at the internal data structure level, things are stored contiguously, but on disk, they're not stored contiguously, right? So this kind of prefetching can only really be done in the data system because, again, the data system knows exactly what your query is trying to do. Is this clear? Okay. So another cool thing you can do in, uh, in your database system is called scan sharing. So let's say that now I have multiple queries running at the same time, and they're both scanning the entire table. Right? And the, all the examples we've shown before so far, uh, we're sort of treating each query in sort of isolation. So if, you know, if they need a page and it's not in memory, then you go fetch it. But in a real system, with, you know, with, with, we have a lot of users, a lot of applications accessing it. You have multiple queries running at the same time, and some of them could be doing uh, the, the same level, you know, low-level disk operations that from one. The, the two queries could be doing the same low-level low disk operations. They may not be running exactly the same query, but they may be running the same the same scan, and therefore we don't want to have to have you know. Uh, fetch things in for one query, throw them out, and then fetch them in again for another query. So if we have queries that show up at the same time that are doing something somewhat similar, then we can piggyback them off one another and get better performance. So the, uh, the basic way to think about this is, again, the, the, there'll be a cursor that the data system maintains for each query that says what page they're looking at and how many pages they, they still have to go in, in their scan. So if you start one query and you have your cursor and it's walking along, and then another one guy shows up, rather than starting him starting at the beginning, you can have him pick up where where the other guy the, the other guy is already at, and you have to know that you can come back around and finish the rest get get rest of the data that you need. So this is fully supported in DB2 and SQL Server, uh, meaning like you can have queries show up at any time uh, and can jump on at any point in in the scan operation. For Oracle. As far as I know, at least in the latest version, they only support what's called cursor sharing. And that's where you, if you have two queries that run exactly the same query, uh, they have the same SQL statement, 
then you, you can piggyback off each other. In, I, in DB2 and SQL Server, they can actually know that, well, they're different queries, but they're doing the same, sequen same sequential scan, so I, I can share the cursors. So this is giving you an example of what this looks like. So I have one query that's doing a scan of the entire table A to compute some aggregate value. Um, so it starts at the beginning. Nothing's in our, in, in our buffer pool, nothing's in memory. So we get the first page, then we scan along, get the next page, and move on, and move on down. So now we get to page three, uh, and that's, that's not in memory, and we need, to, we need to VIX something. So it goes and takes out the first page, because, again, for simplicity, assume we're throwing out the page that was last, last recently used, so that, that would have been page zero. But now page two, or query two comes along, and it wants to execute uh, a computer different aggregate, but it's still a complete sequential scan on this table. So if now we had to actually start the cursor at the beginning uh, and go fetch page zero, that's the worst thing to do because that's the, that's the page we just threw away, right? So instead, what, what, what some systems can do is piggyback Q2 on top of Q1. It goes along and reads all the same data that, Q, that Q1 reads. Sort of think of that as like the, there's like a pub sub method where you have your thread say, you know, generate this cursor, start scanning over the tuples, and notify me when, when a new page comes in. So you sort of have this uh, asynchronous I.O. Uh, effect here. But then when uh, Q1 is done, because it scanned everything, then we can come back around and, fix, and look at all the pages that we missed the first time. Right, again, this is something that the data system can do because it knows what, the, what, what, what queries you're trying to execute. It knows exactly what, what, what the application is trying to do. So I sort of mentioned uh, in the last example that what the policy would be for evicting pages from memory to make space. Um, but now we can go in more detail how this is actually going to work. Um, so the, the buffer replacement policy, which again you have to build in your first project, is essentially some algorithm that the data system is going to implement that allows it to make decisions about what pages to evict when it, when it needs more space, right? If you have enough memory for everything, then you never actually ever have to run this. Uh, but if you do have to you know, evict data, then you have to have some, some procedural way of making decision what, what to throw away. And so the things that we sort of care about in our, uh, in our buffer replacement policy will be correctness, right? We don't want to throw away things that, we don't want to throw away the, exactly the next thing we're, we're going to need. We want to have good accuracy. Right, we, we want our approximations to, to, to be reasonable, and that's sort of related to correctness. Uh, we actually care about speed as well, meaning we can't compute some MP-complete MP algorithm every single time we need to decide when, when to evict a page because we're holding latches and locks in our database system while we're actually doing this. Right? And then also, too, we want to try to minimize the metadata overhead. Uh, this won't be too much of an issue, but some of these... Uh, Replacement policy algorithms require you to maintain extra data structures, um, and so we don't, want, we don't want these to get too big because they become expensive to reverse and expensive to, to maintain. So the most sort of clearly understood and, and widely uh, implemented algorithm is LRU. All right? And I would also say, too, this, this buffer pool replacement policy is like one of the oldest problems, oldest uh, concepts people have explored in research in computer science that goes back to like the 1960s and 50s, right? So there's been a ton of work done on this. Um, and there's also been a ton of work done in the context of database systems. But I'm going to be focusing on, at a high level, just sort of the major ones that, so you know that was out there. So LRU is the simplest one to understand. And basically what's going to happen is that every single page is going to have a timestamp that keep, that where we keep track of when it was last accessed. And you maintain this timestamp in, in your page table. And so, when the data system needs to, to decide when to evict a page, it's just going to select the one that has the, the, the oldest timestamp, because that was the last one that was recently used. And so because we want this eviction to be very quickly, typically you try to maintain the, these, these pages, in, their page IDs, in sorted order, so that it's only just popping off the, the, the front of the, the, the queue to go figure out what page you want to evict. Right? So this is really, really simple, but it does have some overhead, because now you need to maintain this timestamp for every single page. Yes? Um, if you have like, two transactions that are working on the same page, if they're both retransactions and they don't have latch in the page table entries, does that mean you could like, get weird each of these with like, uh, timestamps? His question is, if you have two transactions that are read-only, 
and they're accessing the same page, uh, could you have, so with the last part of the timestamps? Yeah, could it be possible that a slightly newer timestamp, uh, <coughs> a slightly older timestamp would get overwritten? Um, or no, a slightly newer timestamp would get overwritten by an older one? Right, so, sorry, so his question is, uh, if, if you have two transactions that uh, are running at the same time, without getting into this, you're, you're also referring to timestamp ordering, so they're, they're assigned a timestamp that that are unique as their transaction ID, and then you want to update the page with the timestamp to do LRU, you wouldn't actually be using the, the transaction ID's timestamp. So you would, that's sort of like a, a, a logical time, the order of the transactions. This is more of a physical time, like you know, the clock timestamp, right? Yeah, so so that, that's not an issue. Right, so, so the, the issue, the, the, there is some overhead involved in this because, again, we have to maintain this sorted order. Of, of our pages, and we have to update that timestamp every single time they're accessed. Um, the a good approximation or easier way to actually implement uh, uh, LRU is something called clock. And I think I mentioned last clock, last class. Clock is actually what, or some variant of clock is what uh, Linux uses to for their 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 memory management uh, replacement policy. And so basically, what's going to happen is instead of actually maintaining a timestamp for every single page. We're just going to have to store a single bit that says whether the, that page was, was referenced or accessed by a query or transaction since the last time that we checked it. And then what we'll do is we're going to organize all our pages in a circular buffer, and there'll be essentially a clock hand that's going to tick through and check this, this, this reference bit, um, and you, you, you check whenever you need to evict a page. And if the bit is set to, to zero, then you know it has been accessed since the last time you referenced it. So you go ahead and evict it. If it's set to one, then you flip it to zero, and that way when you come back around, you'll check to see whether it was flipped back to one, and therefore you know it was accessed. Right? So let's do a really simple example. We have we have four pages laid out like this, right? And every page will have a reference bit, and for now we'll just we'll initialize them to be zero. So let's say that some transaction accesses the first page, so we'll flip the reference bit to one. And then now there is uh, some other thread needs, needs to get space, so we need to decide which of these pages to evict. So the clock hand first starts here. We check this first page. Its reference bit is set to 1, so therefore we can evict it, uh, but we'll, we'll set the refer bit, reference bit now to 0. So then now we flip over to this guy here. Uh, his reference bit is set to 0, so we know this, this has not been accessed in the last time we checked, so therefore this is safe to evict, and we can put it in a new page. And it's always initialized with the reference bit set to zero. So now, when we say these other two pages get accessed, again, the clock goes around and it updates the, the reference page. But then now we get to here, uh, the first page we, we had. And then the first time we passed through, the bit was set to one, but then we set it to zero. Then when we came back around, now it was set to zero. So now, now for it, this is, this is safe for us to evict. Right? So again, if this is sort of an approximation of LRU. You're just sort of giving this, this reference bit as sort of like a, like a second chance for the, for the page. If it, was, if it was accessed since the last time you checked, then it'll be 1, and therefore you keep it. If not, then it's 0. And so you're not, you don't really care about the exact ordering of knowing precisely what, what page was accessed the least, the least frequently. Um, you just care within sort of an epoch, since you, since you went around the clock, that this page was, was not accessed, and you'll throw it away. So. LRU and clock do have some problems. Um, and the most important problem that we care about in database systems is what's called sequential flooding. And sequential flooding is the problem where the, it may be the case that the least recently used page, or least recently accessed page, is actually important. And it just, the, 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 the reference counters or the timestamps got polluted because some, some query did a complete sequential scan of our, entire, uh, of our entire table. So this is because we're not actually tracking any metadata of how pages are being used um, or how often they're being used. It's just you know, so this coarse grain timestamp to say when it was last used. So to show an example of this, to say that we have some query, and it's doing an LTP query, it's doing a lookup on a single record where ID equals 1. Let's say that this, this tuple exists in page 0. So when the query starts and executes it, uh, we, need, we need a tuple in page 0. So we, we go fetch that in. 
So then that query ends, and now we have a uh, OLAP query that wants to do a sequential scan on all our pages. So now when it, when it starts scanning along, it's going to go grab all the pages that it needs. But now when we get to page three here, if we're running LRU or clock, uh, page zero was, was the one that was, was least frequently used. So far, this is the one that sh that's actually going to get evicted. But now if I have that, sort of this popular query shows up again to go grab that, that ID one record, it's in page zero, but that's just the last thing that, that I evicted. Right? According to LRU, this is correct. Uh, but what we really wanted to maybe do was evict page one because that was, in terms of the, for this scan, that was the last one that was actually used. And therefore, we know we're not going to scan, scan it back again. Right? And so what's missing from clock and LRU are this, this information about how pages were actually being accessed. And so there's a bunch of extra new algorithms. I say new, I mean like 1990s. Uh, sort of newer variants of these things where they do keep in track of, uh, of the access patterns of individual pages and use that to make decisions about what, you know, what's the, what page is the best one to evict. So there's an extension of LRU called LRUK. And basically, think of this as there's an extra data structure where you, you keep the history of when pages were accessed. Right? And then you can also do additional things like priority hints, uh, where you can have the data system tell the buffer pool that this page is important. So for example, the, the, the root node of every index is, every thread is always going to have to go through that. So maybe the data system wants to never uh, you know, evict any index page that's, that's the root. But the leaf pages maybe we don't care about so much. Or if we know that we're always inserting things in, in an index, that we're always going to be inserting into the right side of the tree, and maybe we don't need to keep the left side of the tree in memory. So there's additional hints that we can get out of our, 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 our database system to provide to the buffer pool manager that we can use then to also make decisions about our indexes. And the last one, also a technique we'd also do, called, was called localization. And this is where the database management system will keep track of the sort of read-write set for pages for individual transactions. And then we'll limit the amount of memory or pages that a transaction is allowed to you know, bring into the buffer pool. So for example, in my example here, uh, I only have three pages in my buffer pool. And for query two, it was allowed to use all of them. But maybe I could have avoided that problem where page zero got evicted if I said, well, query two is only allowed to have two pages. And therefore, it can only evict, uh, you know, it can only swap in things, things in and out that, that it touches. So in this case here, it wouldn't have evicted page zero uh, because, you know, page zero was being used by uh, you know, other, other threads or other queries. But it was the only thread that actually needed page one and page, page two. So therefore, when it needed to evict a page, it would not choose the one that's using by other, used by other people. It would choose the one that it's only using. Right? So again, this is another thing. This is another aspect of, of, of database systems where the the commercial guys actually have very sophisticated algorithms to do all this sort of management stuff, to do, uh, to try to infer and use, use sort of heuristics and other things to try to infer what the best decision is for the eviction policy. Uh, whereas things like Postgres and uh, MySQL, I mean, they're not, they're not just using vanilla LRU, but they're, they're definitely not as robust or not as complicated as, as the, the, the commercial guys. Okay? So the, other thing we can talk about now, too, is also uh, what I call allocation policies. And that's sort of related to the localization stuff that I talked about before is, is again, is how the data system will make decisions about, uh, about what it should do when a particular thread or transaction or query makes requests for the, to get data or get, get memory. And so everything showed, before, show, so, showed so far are what are called global policies where Again, there's a single uh, uh, buffer pool, and it's running some algorithm that, that tries to look at everything, try to maximize the, the throughput or the uh, locality of pages for the entire system. But you can also have what are called lo local policies, where you take for a single transaction, you try to understand what it actually wants to do, and make decisions on what to evict based on what you expect to happen. So again, if, if you know that your transaction is going to be accessing uh, the same index over and over again, you maybe try to keep those pages for that index in memory for that particular transaction. Uh, 
So it's sort of a yin and yang thing where sometimes the, the best policy for a local transaction or a local query may not be the best policy for the, the, the global system. And the, typically the way the commercial guys support these different kinds of policies is that you can set transaction priorities. So you can designate some transactions or queries as being more important or more mission critical than other queries. And then the data system internally can, can make decisions that favor those higher priority queries than the sort of the, the riffraff, right? And that's very common you see in, in enterprise applications, right? And think about this, like think of like in a, um, say in, in an OLAP database system, when the CEO runs a query, you want to get the answer back right away. When Joe Schmo in accounting runs a query, you'll, you'll make a best effort. Right? And the, again, the commercial systems allow, allow you to do this. So the last thing to talk about now, too, is what are other things in memory that, that what, are, what are other types of memory we want to use in our, in our database system? So we've already talked about index pages. We've already talked about tuple pages. But as we see now going forward when we talk about query processing, there's a ton of extra stuff that needs memory. And some of these things will be backed by disk pages, meaning we can write into them and we can spill out the disk if we, if we run out of space. Other things that we, we can consider to be ephemeral, and it's OK that if we, just, if we run out of space, we just delete things. So this will come up a lot when we talk about sorting and, and join algorithms. Right? You want to be able to sort tables that are larger than the amount of memory, or the, join, the intermediate result for, for, your, for your query may be larger than the amount of memory that you have. And you want to have specialized sort buffers or join buffers so that you can spill those guys out the disk without ruining the rest of your disk pages. Query caches are when you actually uh, sort, of, sort of like memoization where you record the exact response of a single query. This is an example where maybe you don't care so much about keeping, keeping it around because if you run out of space, you just blow away the, ca the query cache. Because then the next time you see that same query, you just have to recompute it. There's things like maintenance buffers, like reorganization like we saw in Postgres. Uh, there's log buffers, which we'll talk about when we do a log of recovery. And then dictionary caches would be for, uh, for compression. Again, these, some, all of these things will, will typically be also managed by a buffer pool manager. Because again, that's the thing that's managing the memory for, for the system. Uh, so you try to avoid things just like mallocking any, anywhere you want. Um, and the, a lot of data systems will, will spend a lot of effort to make sure that there's absolutely no memory leaks at all because that would then be taking memory that could be used as for, your, for your buffer pool. So every, every, every major data system has very rigorous QA tests and other, another um, testing that they do to make sure that there's never any, any memory leak for the database system. All right? OK. So the, the main takeaway from all of this is that the data system is always going to be able to manage memory better than, than the operating system. And if anybody tells you otherwise, they're, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, of course, now, now we're going to get emails. Um, so uh, again, and, and then the buffer pool manager is, is what the system will use as the interface to get data in and out from disk. And then it can also be used for ephemeral, uh, ephemeral memory for things that like intermediate query results. OK? So any questions about this? All right, so next class, and I, I actually want to give a quick demo before we leave. Uh, in next class, uh, we're going to now start talking about hashing, right? Because now we're going to start talking about sort of going up the stack of actually building data structures we're going to need to do query processing and, and make, these, make these things run, run efficiently. So we'll talk about open hashing, extendable hashing, linear hashing, cuckoo hashing. And then on, uh, on Wednesday, we'll start talking about uh, order preserving your tree indexes, OK? All right, so real quick, so last class, I sort of glossed over this topic as quickly, and we have some extra time. I want to show it. Um, all right. So last class we talked about uh, how the data system is going to represent types, and I sort of blew this past very quickly. But I said that there's basically two types of decimals, right? There's the floating point decimals and the fixed point decimals, and I said the floating point decimals are actually handled by the the processor. Right, the CPU. Um, but the issue is that with, with, with floating point numbers is that it's sort of arbitrary precision. So you may end up getting different results. And I showed this sort of example here where if you run this simple C program of just taking 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, uh, you actually can get wildly different results, right? Even though it technically should be the same thing. And again, this is because the 
CPUs can't precisely store floating point numbers. So we had the same issue in our database system uh, where we have different types. So you can have a, uh, if, you, if you're okay, sorry, if you're okay with, um, with you know, having those rounding errors, then you can use real or, or, or floats. Um, but if you need pr precision of, of your decimals, then you want to use numeric or decimal. Right? And then what happens is that uh, the, the database system will store this essentially like a, like a, like a struct where it's going to maintain extra information about exactly where the decimal point is, what's on the right-hand side, what's on the left-hand side, uh, and what the scale is. Right? So in this case here, this is in Postgres. Right? For a single numeric type, you end up having to store four 32-bit integers plus a, uh, a pointer to some kind of uh, a char up, up, up here. Right? So in a 32-bit in a floating point number, you can, again, you store that in 30, 32 bits. In this case here, we essentially have to store that in, um, what is that, uh, 20 bytes. And so this has a big impact on actually performance. Um, so if you go to here, Postgres, So I've loaded, I've loaded in Postgres a table with, two tables with, um, oh, you can't see it? Sorry. Still no? This might ruin the demo. Okay. Of course, now, now I can't see it. Awesome. All right, so this is Postgres running on, on a machine in my office. And um, and so I, I've loaded two tables uh, with I think uh, 50 million, 50 million uh, uh, tu tuples. And these two tuples have, they have two fields. And so in the, in the first table, in the first, they have two fields, two, two decimals. And the first one, I'm going to store them as reals, as, the, as the, the, the floating point numbers. And in the second one, I'm going to store them as decimals, as, as the actual numeric type. Right? So for this, we're going to run first on, on, on the, um, we're going to run on the reals table. And for this, explain analyze basically actually runs the query and then uh, will tell you how, uh, the query plan, how long it took. Right? So this query took, uh, running on reals took eight, eight seconds. Right? And then now if I run that same query on the decimals, Right? It's going to take much longer because it actually has to look at that struct, figure out exactly what the type, type is, uh, and how to add these numbers together. I think this should take roughly 20 seconds. Right? So this is an ex sort of an example that if you're using the native types that the processor supports, right, so it took twice, twice as long, it took 16 seconds. Uh, if you use the native types that the processor supports, it's really, really fast to do arithmetic and other operations. If you now need to do more complex things, then that's actually going to be much slower. So, and, and then the, the numeric one is it's a perfect example of this. So, just to show you that we, you know, we're, how long, I, uh, sorry, to show you that, um, that the answer is actually correct. So, this is essentially what we're doing in, in the Python code, right? For the same thing. We're just going to add these two numbers together and print it out. And this will take roughly 30 seconds. The, the database system, when it has the native type, can do this in, uh, in exactly um, you know, eight seconds. Actually, let's see. I guess the question is whether is Python doing the floating point numbers or the fixed point numbers? So what we can do is go back to, um, to Postgres here and run that same query on the decimals. Oh. Let's see what the answer it gets. 
right? So this point too, but also I say, I already ran the query before, so everything's all in, 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 the, in the buffer pool caches. So this is all pure computation here, right, of having to take those structs. So it says what? So it computes that number, and then if we go look at what, um, this is what Python gives you. It looks like it's off, right? Huh. Yeah, it's missing some of the rounding part, right? So again, the how the data will, will, will actually represent the types in your tuples um, can matter a lot performance. All right, so any questions? Okay, so again, homework two is due tonight. Homework three will be released uh, tonight, and then uh, we'll, have, we'll have class on Monday. We'll start talking about indexes. Okay? All right, guys, take care.